uh, beginning with verse 14. <clears throat> Romans chapter 5 and verse 14. Death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man Jesus Christ, overflow to the many. Again, the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned, through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was added so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Amen. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. Good morning, Mesa Church. Good to see you all. What a weekend this has been. I am telling you what, it has been so incredible. Uh, I got to attend my first high school football game, Arizona style, Friday night. It was awesome. I had so much fun, transported me back to my youth ministry days, and it was great. Uh, Catherine Murphy cheers for uh, Gilbert Christian and got to go out Friday night on a lovely evening. I mean, lovely. It was so nice. I have not experienced Arizona football when it's 106 degrees outside, so <laughs> I was really grateful for the, the cooler weather, and that was fun. Got to go to a little talent show last night. I've just been immersed an Arizona culture, and it's really fun. I'm going to tell your next preaching candidate, just move here. Don't even question it, right? It's just a great place to live, great place to be. I want to go ahead and dive right into the text this morning. Um, we're going to be really looking um, and reading actually quite a bit of Scripture from Ephesians chapter 2. So if you've got your Bibles, please take those out. Have them close by. If you've got a pen or a pencil, please be prepared to take some notes. Uh, I want to give credit where credit's due. A few years back, I actually heard a sermon on this text from a gentleman named Pete Chiafalo, and it was one of the most brilliant exposés of uh, Ephesians chapter 2 that I've ever heard. And I heard that sermon, I think it's like 10 years ago now, and, and he made two primary points. I'm going to make four today, but he made two. And those have stuck with me ever since I heard that message, and I hope they will stick with you as well. I just thought it was uh, well done and uh, not, uh, not copying his sermon, but I am using uh, some of the material that he shared uh, to share with you today. And I always want to make sure that I cite my sources and give credit where credit is due. Uh, we're going to jump right into Ephesians 2. I'm uh, going to begin reading at verse 1 uh, today. And again, please ask you to follow along in your Bibles. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts like the rest. We were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. 
It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. Expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. And so as we reflect on the reading of this text, there's one overarching truth Uh, to which I want to draw your attention, and then I want to show you how I think this is spelled out in Scripture. So point number one, as disciples of Christ, we must remember our history. We have to remember our history. I want you to notice the before and after affect, and just look back at your Scripture again if you have your Bible open. I just want you to kind of see what Paul draws here. The, um, the former state and the new state comparisons that he draws here. Before Jesus, we were dead in our transgressions. Before Jesus, we constantly missed the mark. Before Jesus, we were led around by our flesh, following the desires of our flesh without worry of outcome. Before Jesus, we deserve God's wrath. Before Jesus, we were dead in our transgressions. And this is a significant part of our history that we must not forget. Before Jesus, this is how we were. But in Christ, this is how you are. And this is who you are. And here's the best news that I can give you this morning. This part of our story is not the end of the story, who we were. It's not the end of the story. Notice again in verse 4, chapter 2, because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ. You see, we have been resurrected too, from the old man to the new man, in Christ Paul notes here, it is by grace that you have been saved. You see, because of Jesus, we have been raised up with Christ. Because of Jesus, we are seated in the heavenly realms. Because of Jesus, we are recipients of His kindness, His mercy, His grace. Because of Jesus, we have been saved by grace. Grace, And I want you to notice that Paul says that twice in this same passage, it is by grace you have been saved. Parents, have you ever said to your kids, I already told you once. You ever said that? Why does Paul say it twice? Well, I think it's because in case you didn't hear me the first time, verse 5, let me say it again in verse 8. It is by grace that you have been saved. In verse 12, Paul writes, remember, remember, there's the word, remember your history. Remember at that time you were separate from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. Church, we must remember our history. Who we were before Christ and who we are after Christ and his resurrection power. But that's not all. There is an equally important part of our journey that we must always remember. So let's go back to the text to see what it is. 
Ephesians 2, beginning at verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He, that's Jesus, Jesus came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. So first, we must remember our history. But as disciples of Jesus, we must also remember our geography. We must remember where we live. Because you see, we used to be, before Jesus, we used to be far away. But now we're brought near. We used to be at odds with one another, but now we are one. We used to be held captive by countless rules and regulations, but now we're free in Christ. We used to be apart from God, but now we're reconciled to Him. We used to be on the outside looking in, but now we're under God's roof. We're a family in God's house. We are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. Church, we must remember our geography. It's really important for us to understand, and I, I can't really overemphasize this enough, but Satan, Satan will do everything he possibly can to keep our history and our geography outside of our conscious awareness. He'll use, he'll use everything from the tyranny of the tiny uh, to spiritual tsunamis to take our attention off of what Christ Jesus has done and is doing and where we have lived and where we now live. So I'll give you a little example here of what I mean, of how this kind of plays out. It's uh, um, coming into a, a situation, coming into a community and making transition. And I just want to show you how this kind of worked in our current context and a few practical examples of what this could mean here for the Mesa Church. Um, About six years ago, we moved to College Station, Texas. Have any of y'all ever been there? Anybody been to College Station, visited A&M University? Um, I just want to say this morning, and and hopefully, I know this is being recorded, and maybe uh, maybe I won't get in too much trouble for saying this, but but people in College Station are just really weird, okay? I'm just going to put that out there. They are a strange, strange bunch. And um, people who went to A&M University, I, they just do some things that are really odd. Really, really odd. I want you to look at this picture. Um, when they sing the Texas Aggie, the fight song, complete strangers put their arms around each other and they sway back and forth. And so the very first game I went to, people literally, I didn't even know, they just came up to me and put their arms around me and we just started swaying. And I just thought it was one of the oddest things I've ever seen in my life. 
I was really uncomfortable. I'm like, dude, I'm extroverted, but this is just kind of over the top, okay? I don't know if I can handle this. Now, you all have to understand something. Now, tradition runs really, really deep in Aggieland. I mean really deep, okay? Uh, almost cult-like deep. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting phenomenon. I grew up as a Vanderbilt football fan. Now, that, that's an oxymoron, Vanderbilt football, okay? That's an oxymoron. Um, but when I, so when I kind of got to A&M, I was like a stranger in a foreign land, okay? Can you track with me? I came from zero tradition, all right? Most Vanderbilt students were in the library studying physics, okay, or calculus or something. Um, and so I, I, I didn't really even know how this whole tradition thing were. I came from a culture. I came from a football culture of please clock, just run as fast as possible so that we can be out of our misery, okay? That was the, that was the culture that I came from to a new culture that said Aggies never lose they just run out of time, okay? That was, that's the justification that you, that you hear there. They just run out of time. So I didn't, I, I was having culture shock. I didn't know how to get my head around this. I didn't kind of know where I would fit into this. I was an outsider looking in. Any of you experienced that when you moved here to Phoenix? Any of you experienced that when you came to the, to the Mesa church? That's kind of odd. Why, why do they do that? Or what's, what's that all about? Or I've never heard that word before. What does that mean? Now, something happened after we had been at A&M for a while, and I just thought this was so fascinating. There were people there who cared very deeply about A&M University. Um, and they cared enough about it to help me understand why they act the way they do. Where some of this behavior that is driven by their deep love and their deep tradition, they help me understand where some of it came from. One of our brothers at the church, his name is Dean, he's in his mid-80s. He took me around campus and he showed me some of the various memorials. And at some of those memorials, he, he wept. And he took time to explain to me the university's history. And another brother took me to various buildings, and he shared stories of Aggie's past and, and, and present. And he explained to me the university's geography. And so over several months, I really began to um, appreciate and understand the university's history. And if I begin to understand and appreciate the university's geography, um, I still get a little nervous when a complete stranger walks up to me and puts his arms around me and we start singing words that I don't fully understand. But here's the deal. We've lived there almost six years now and I have grown to love the people and the place more than I love my own discomfort. Does that make sense? So practically speaking, when someone comes in your doors here for the first time, there's going to be an awkwardness. Uh, unless they're familiar with churches of Christ, right? And there might not be as much awkwardness in that context but they might not understand why we do communion the way we do. They might not get why we sing the way that we sing. They might not get how sermons function in the context of a worship assembly. I mean, all kinds of things that they don't, they don't understand. What an incredible opportunity that God has given you as a church to love well. And whether you're an elementary school student or whether you're in your 80s, you can help people who come in these doors. You can help them understand your history and learn your geography. And it's, it's an incredible, incredible gift. As important as a university's history is or a university's geography, 
As important as um, a church's history, a local church's history, and a local church's geography, as important as those things are, it's incredibly important that we, we understand our history and geography in, in Jesus because that's a history and a geography that Satan wants to take from us. If you don't believe what I'm telling you, I just want you to look at a few other verses that are scattered throughout the book of Ephesians. We mentioned this last Sunday morning from the last part of verse 19 through verse 21, that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted, the power of God through Christ. When he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly realms, far above, and I want you to notice what I have circled here, all rule and authority, power and dominion. And every name that's invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Notice these words again from chapter 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Two weeks from today, when we're in chapter 3, we're going to see this passage from chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27, and do not give the devil a foothold. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 and 12, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Ephesians 6, 16. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So I want to ask you a question. Who is our enemy? Who is our enemy? Yes, that's exactly right. Paul spells out how the devil manifests himself through multiple powers and authorities and beings and demons. And he uses this language. He talks about rule and authority. Power and dominion, the ruler of the kingdom of the air, rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, the devil, powers of the dark world, spiritual forces of evil, the evil one himself. Now, some of these terms are neutral, and they may apply to actual physical rulers or authority, but some of these are clearly forces of darkness, unseen agents of Satan who are about basically one thing, and that's wreaking havoc in this world. Note again from Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. There is a Greek word that is used here that is not used anywhere else in the entire Bible. Not in the Septuagint, the Old Testament, not in the Greek text in the New Testament. Um, it is the word uh, cosmocrateris. It's actually really hard for me to say cosmocrateris. Uh, let's shorten it a little bit and let's just think cosmocrats, okay? The cosmocrats. And it's used here to describe rulers. There is not one cosmocrat. The Greek word is plural. Uh, there are many cosmocrats. Uh, they are evil. They're so evil, in fact, that they require the whole armor of God to hold at bay. Now, they've already been defeated, but only the faithful in Jesus can fully withstand their influence. Only the faithful in Christ can fully withstand their influence. Have you ever watched the news and thought to yourself, that person has lost his mind? Or that person has lost her mind. You ever thought that? There may be some truth to that. Now, I can laugh about it. I can laugh it off. But there may be something perhaps that we understand that perhaps that person has indeed lost his spiritual mind. 
or she has lost her spiritual mind. And I believe that that can happen because the cosmocrats are always whispering. They're always lying. They're always trying to deceive you. They're always trying to make you forget your history. And they're trying to make you forget your geography. If we read this passage as rendered in the message, this is no afternoon athletic contest that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps. A life or death fight to the finish against the devil and all his angels. Church, as disciples of Jesus, we must not forget our history, we must not forget our geography, and we must remember who the real enemy is. The real enemy is not sitting in these pews. The real enemy is the devil and his agents of darkness. Here's my translation of Ephesians 6. I kind of tried to break the Greek down and, 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 and put it in, in terms that Help me understand the heart of what Paul is trying to say here. Uh, our fight is not against each other. That's the very thing Satan wants. Open your eyes. The fight for our very souls is against unseen spiritual forces who have one goal in mind, total destruction. And I believe the world bears witness to that, does it not? Because what happens when we take our eyes off Jesus? What happens when our heart is turned away from Jesus? Do things not begin to fall apart? Most of the time, I think the answer is a pretty clear yes. F.F. F. Bruce writes about these powers in the unseen realm, these rulers, these authorities. And he notes, they will do their best to reclaim the people of Christ for their own dominion, but their attempts will be fruitless if, and this may be one of those times that the word if is a whole lot bigger, if the people of Christ resist them with the spiritual resources which are now placed at their disposal. Only spiritual resources can prevail against them for they themselves are spiritual forces and forces of evil at that. So if you ever wonder why, when you're tempted, you hear these voices in your head that say, go on, it's not so bad, or I don't think anybody's ever going to find out about this one, or yeah, yeah, trust what your friends are telling you more than what Scripture tells you. Where does that come from? I don't think it just comes from Flesh and blood, I think there's something else out there. Either we believe Paul or we don't. And I think he's pretty clear here about how the uh, tactics of Satan are manifested in so many different ways. In Ephesians chapter 4, a text we'll look at a little bit more in detail in a few weeks, Paul writes, As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. The Phillips translation, I beg you to live lives worthy of your calling. This word, this, this verb, uh, action verb, beg or urge, is from the Greek uh, parakalo, and it literally means I'll come alongside you. In this case, I'll come alongside and I'm going to plead with you, encouraging you with all my might. Just be who Jesus asks you to be. And so church, I want to encourage you over the next many months, remember your history. Remember your geography. Remember who the real enemy is and listen for the voice the voice of God, the voice that is above all other voices. Fulfilled in Christ Jesus, who reigns victorious. We'll talk more about that the next time that we're together. I appreciate you being with me this morning in the text. Uh, we're going to close our time in, uh, in the text this morning uh, for now. I hope you'll stay in it uh, beyond today and through the rest of the week. 
And I want to encourage you, if there's anything we can do this morning to bless you in any way, perhaps you want to be baptized, have your sins washed away, put on that full armor of God so that you can resist the temptation of the evil one. And uh, perhaps you need prayer this morning or just uh, uh, for any number of reasons. So we're not going to uh, judge, uh, judge what that's about. But if you do need prayer this morning, a couple of the shepherds will be up front. And we're going to stand together. We're going to sing together.